the next talk is going to be by Edith Aldridge from uh, Academia Seneca and University of Washington. The title of the talk is proto austronesian Case and its Diachronic Development. All right. Um, thank you so much. And it's great to be here. Hi, everybody. So this is a talk about syntactic reconstruction. And today I am looking at Proto-Austronesian case markers. In the interest of time, we will focus on nominative case. And I'm also going to talk about the methodology of syntactic reconstruction as we go through the talk. And the first step in the so-called comparative method is to gather together what we're comparing. So we're going to look first at the correspondence set, which is case paradigms in a number three uh, Formosan languages. We're looking first at Puyuma, and today I'm interested in the nominative E for personal uh, nouns and the no nominative A for nonspecific common nouns. The na in the middle, I think, is comes from a demonstrative, and I'm not going to be concerned with it today. So examples of them in their natural habitat are given in two. Uh, unfortunately, I won't have time to talk about the non-nominative forms. Those are shown in italics. The nominatives are in bold. The personal nominative in two A, the common nominative in two C. The next language in the correspondence set is going to be Rukai, represented by the Tanan dialect. Now, Rukai is rather unique in showing a, a single consonant initial for a nominative marking. Uh, it is the general pattern across these languages and Austronesian languages in general that personal and common nouns have different marking even when the case is the same. This is a key feature of the syntax and must be accounted for in a diachronic account. This is something I'm going to really focus on today. The anomaly in Rukai I think has an explanation historically and synchronically as well. This reflects a topic marker, which I will talk a lot about. And I think that the K continues to be in Rukai today, mostly a topic marker. Uh, we see examples in 4A of the personal marking with ku. So the vowel is different uh, and the common noun nominative gets ka marking. This is an, a WH indefinite. I'm very proud of myself for finding this example. But um, if we go on to the next language, we see Amis. Now, Amis shows us very beautifully the asymmetry between personal nominatives and common nominatives. So Amis has a tz kind of affricate for uh, nominative personal nouns and reflects the K uh, that we just saw in Rukai for common noun nominatives. We see an example of the personal nominative in 6a and an example of the common nominative in 6b. So to summarize the key points in the data set here, uh, the main thing that I'm looking at, there are two. One is the asymmetry between personal and common noun marking. The second is we just saw quite a bit of variation. So just the, the vowel uh, nominative markers in Puyuma, the K initial markers in Rukai, um, and the K for common nouns in Amis and the for personal nouns in Amis. And the job of, of uh, linguistic reconstruction is whatever we reconstruct, we then have to account for the variation in our contemporary data set, our correspondence set, through processes of natural change. So the next step we're going to look at now is this reconstructions. And that is shown in eight. Um, now I'm giving you a somewhat abstract case marking system. Um, I'm only going to talk about the nominatives today and the topic marker K. The nominatives uh, are basically just bare determiners with an overt determiner and we have different ones depending on the type of argument they mark. So things with a person feature get the E marking and then U or A for common nouns depending on specificity. If you're interested in the non-nominative forms please ask me later. I have lots of things to say and discuss with you about that. Otherwise the K is going to come from a topic marker and the 
the advocate that we saw in Amis, uh, that has a different source that I will talk about later in the talk. The last thing I'll say in this section is I'll point you to the subgrouping hypothesis that I assume in, in my work on historical Austronesian syntax, and that is that Proto-Austronesian was an accusative language and that the ergative type or split ergative type of alignment that is commonly referred to as a focus or voice system was innovated in two separate stages. First in the language proto-ergative uh, Austronesian and that is reflected mostly in Zhou and Puyuma quite fully and also in Irialis mood in what uh, Malcolm Ross has proposed as the nuclear Austronesian subgroup where we see a second innovation that took nominalized clauses and turned them into matrix um, ergative type clauses. Um, and today uh, the uh, my reconstruction of the case markers is not going to have anything direct to say about alignment in PAN, but I will propose a new uh, innovation, a second innovation to bolster Malcolm Ross's nuclear Austronesian hypothesis. Um, that will be specifically the origin of the, the personal nominative marker in Amis, which is a nuclear Austronesian language. All right. So now, Speaking of Malcolm Ross, and let's see, oh, we can only look at one of them at a time. Um, I wanted to show you Blust and Ross at the same time, but we mm, can't do that. All right, let's look at Malcolm Ross's proposal for reconstructing pan case markers. One thing that is very striking about this proposal is that um, he, like Bob Blust, assumes that there's uniform case marking regardless of what type of argument uh, you're signaling or you're marking for case. So personal and common nouns both have a common consonant initial and this is something for which there is almost no evidence in um, Austronesian languages that are relevant for this comparison. The only evidence that Ross can draw on is the Rukai uh, example that I showed you where you have consistent K marking, but as I said, I do believe that this continues to just function as a topic marker. Um, there, there's also another problem with the accusative or the non-nominative forms, and the the capital C here is a this is a dental affricate, and it might be said to be reflected in non-nuclear Austronesian languages, but only for common nouns, and the K also only for common noun nominative marking is all that he has robust evidence for, I think. Uh, but there is robust evidence for at least the part I have in bold, and also for the determiners, which I assume in my own work as I showed you a moment ago. Now, BLUST, interestingly, is kind of a mirror image of Ross's proposal in terms of, I think, what he has robust evidence for. And if we look at the nuclear Austronesian languages, there is ample evidence for the C nominative marking. And this is precisely what I'm going to propose is the new innovation for the nuclear Austronesian subgroup. I think he's spot on about that, but only for, uh, that Blust is spot on about this nominative marker, but only for personal nouns and only in nuclear Austronesian languages. He also has a really good point about the non-nominative key, but uh, his reconstructions just don't apply to common nouns. I really don't think there's any evidence for this outside of, say, the Philippines. So, uh, so for, at the top of the tree, there isn't any evidence uh, and no robust evidence for this whatsoever. So if you combine these two approaches, what what we can say they have good evidence for is summarized in 12 and 13. And this is combining the two. Neither one of them gets at the full system, but I find that it's fascinating that each of them um, gives us part of the paradigm, or at least um, maybe not for PAN so much. I don't think they do such a good job with PAN, but that combined, they, I think they do a good job with nuclear Austronesian. Um, the, and I'm going to assume something similar to what we see in 13 for proto-nuclear Austronesian. But PAN is going to have to be different. And the main reason that PAN has to be different, even from the partial reconstruction in 12, is 
in order to account for the significant variation that we saw in section one, we are going to need a more um, abstract reconstruction in order to account for synchronic variation in terms of natural change. So returning to my reconstruction, um, I won't go through it again. I'm showing it to you in 14. The next step in reconstruction is to, well, imagine what kind of language we're producing. Well, I think it's a perfectly normal kind of language. It's a language that does not have an overt nominative case marker. These occur all over the world. Turkish is one of them, but they're it's quite common. Um, and for accusative marking, we have accusative marking um, only for specific noun phrases and otherwise objects are just unmarked. All right, and of course so we have the topic marker K and what I'm going to do next, the next step in our process is to give us evidence for these various morphemes. So the first, the basically it's just the determiners and the topic marker K. So you see the contemporary nom, nom, nominative mark, markers in the correspondence set. Again, this is the, what we have to ultimately account for. The determiners, uh, E, U, and A, um, these are reflect, E and A are reflected directly as nominative case markers in Puyuma, Paiwan, and some other languages. Uh, the A is reflected in Tagalog, for instance. The Ang is A plus a linker. Uh, let's see. We also have uh, very good evidence for E and either A or U as functional heads on the DP spine because this encodes information about the noun phrase, so whether it's a personal noun or a common noun. So definitely these are functional heads on the DP spine today and in so many languages of Taiwan and the Philippines. And of course, we see these markers showing up in case markers all over the place. Uh, now, the opposition between the two common noun markers, U and A, there's only evidence for this outside of nuclear Austronesian. Though so Ross points out he doesn't assign functions to these two determiners. He just says they mark common nouns. And he's right to point out that evidence for different functions is rather scant. Uh, but evidence can be found outside of nuclear Austronesian. A uh, in Puyuma marks nonspecific common nouns. And there's an opposition in Rukai between U or, well, what reflects U on the one hand and A. Uh. So U is always more specific, A uh, is always less specific. Now, and I think that the reason that there is no discernible distinction between U and A uh in nuclear Austronesian languages is because as most of us know from the voice system uh, that it, we're most familiar with, the, the quote unquote Philippine type system, is that uh, nominative DPs just tend to be specific. So I think what happened was the, the function of the non-specific non nominative marker was simply lost and the two markers coalesced. Some languages retain U, some languages retain A. A very simple story. All right, so the next morphine that we need to uh, account for uh, is the topic marker K. And I mentioned before that I think that in Rukai, K still is basically a topic marker. Um, so pronouns, for instance, can be topicalized when um, they are preceded by a reflex of the K. And interestingly, we also see agreement on the verb. So a clitic pronoun agreeing with the topicalized pronoun shows up on the verb. So this is a clitic left dislocation scenario. So clearly the marked, the ku-marked pronoun is a topic. So now the next step in, in the process, in the methodology here, is to show how from the reconstructions we can derive the functions of these morphemes um, in in the contemporary languages. So we're going to start with topic marking going to nominative case. First of all, we know from um, other work in historical linguistics that topics are easily reanalyzed as subjects. So I'm assuming that topic marking can be reanalyzed as a nominative case a marker. Um, and bear in mind also that PAN, even if, even if it had accusative alignment, it still had the extraction restriction. So topics were by and large subjects anyway. So it's, it's a no-brainer for the topic marker to be reinterpreted as a nominative case marker. And so 
what happens is precisely that. We get a relabeling. The topic marker just becomes a case marker for nominative. Now, this only happened for common nouns. One reason might be, I'm not sure about this, but it could be because the K ultimately comes from a demonstrative, which would have been incompatible with personal names anyway. Um, and we see here that K marking is generally reflected only on common nouns. We see that in amis here uh, for um, nominative marking. Puyuma faithfully uh, reflects the determiners of Proto-Austronesian, the E and the A. And Rukai the K I really think is still a topic marker. But back in our data set we did have a key marker for non-nominative. It's basically a dative marker. So how is it that the K, which I think this is the same topic K, um, shows up here as non-nominative rather than nominative. And note that this is only for personal nouns. All right, and so we see an example of key marking here in, in Rukai on a, um, a direct object giving it dative case when it's personal. Now, the answer to this question of where the key comes from begins with answering the question of where does E, the determiner, come from. So, so far I've only told you that E was a determiner for basically the spell out of a person feature in Pan. Uh, but it, in turn, has its own story, and it comes from a locative preposition in Proto-Austronesian. So, and we can reconstruct, we have to reconstruct this locative preposition to pan, because it is ubiqui ubiquitously, uh, it is, well, let's just say it's reflected in many subgroups of uh, the Austronesian family. So we know that pan had it too. But I think that Pan synchronically had both the preposition E and the determiner E, and earlier there was a split, uh, and the preposition um, in a particular syntactic environment was reanalyzed as the determiner E. Now, how did that happen? I think that there was an earlier process of topicalization before, perhaps before the K was reanalyzed as a topic marker from a, deter from a demonstrative. And so um, personal nouns, noun phrases, when they were topicalized, they were selected by this preposition E. Now, why would this be the case? Why, why do you have to have them packaged as a PP? And I'm going to suggest to you that the reason is to license the person feature. As we know, person features require licensing. Uh, this requirement is far more stringent than for common nouns. And you might ask, well, but didn't the thing get nominative case before it became a topic? And I'm going to suggest that even if it got nominative case before, uh, it doesn't carry it with it. This, I take a, a view of labeling that says, if you see it, it's there. If you don't see it, it isn't there. And uh, licensing can be encoded in one of three ways, either by position, if there is no overt marker or agreement, or by agreement or by overt marker. But if you if you don't have any overt marker for case or agreement, if you move the thing out of its case position, then it doesn't have case licensing anymore. So we need an exceptional licensor. And I think that's what the E preposition is doing here. And so bear in mind, this was an earlier reanalysis um, that gave us the determiner E. In, which is reflected in Puyuma as the nominative personal case marker. So this became the nominative marker, uh, or at least the determiner spelling out the person feature in Pan. Now, where does the non-nominative K come from? Well, K later on, by this time after the E determiner has already been formed, K is just a topic marker, doesn't, it's not a preposition, it does not have the ability to license a person feature. So if, if K is now going to attach to personed uh, topics, then we still have to have now the preposition E uh, in this constituent in order to license the person feature. So this is where we get key, but key is still going to be this whole constituent, key DP, is going to be a prepositional phrase. This is because the topic marker is not able to project its own category label. It inherits the category from its sister. 
So a topicalized PP is still a PP. So now, once the reanalysis has taken place of key as as a, a dative preposition, this argument can only surface now in positions for dative PPs. Uh, so that, I think, is the origin of this key non-nominative marker for personal names that we see, not in all languages in Taiwan and the Philippines, but we do see it um, cropping up hither and thither. All right. Now, I wish I had time to talk about 30. 30 is a very important part of my argument. Um, why It is true, actually, that K attaches to, uh, we see it representing nominative case on some pronouns, and these guys do indeed have person features. Uh, how is it possible that K can attach to them? Um, if you want to know the answer to that question, feel free to ask me about it later. I'm actually already basically out of time, so I'm going to have to summarize the remaining bits very quickly for you. I hope I'll be allowed to do that. So I do want to say just a tiny bit about the new innovation that I'm proposing for the nuclear Austronesian subgroup. In essence, I think that the process that we saw with E, the preposition being reanalyzed as a determiner, is repeated in proto-nuclear Austronesian, but with a different morpheme. So the E by this time has lost its ability to signal a nominative DP. And the reason for that is because we see E showing up ubiquitously in, in all cases marking on personal nouns. So it's no longer um, it able to signal nominative exclusively. So we need a new marker. Another thing, so the new marker, of course, is going to be reflected in Amis as this um, And what I'm going to suggest, this in Amis reflects the S in Pan. I think this is fairly well agreed upon. And um, I'm going to suggest the evidence from this is not extremely robust and it's not crucial that it be a preposition, but it needs to be a marker of extraction because the other innovation that Malcolm Ross identified for this subgroup is the reanalysis of embedded nominalizations as matrix clauses, ergative transitive clauses, in which naturally the nominative element has been extracted either as a focus or a topic. So this is an extraction context, and um, as I just pointed out before, in an extraction context, uh, the person feature needs to be licensed. So E now has just been reanalyzed as a person feature, so it needs another layer, another bit of superstructure in order to come in and license it. So one possibility is that there is this S preposition which serves that function. All right, and this is where the S comes from. And this is reflected ubiquitously in the um, daughters of proto-nuclear Austronesian. So it is, I think, can be said to be a, a subgroup defining um, innovation. And it is not found outside of this subgroup, crucially. All right? So, and then this S can later be reanalyzed as nominative or as a determiner. Um, and so here we have the new innovation of this S to nominative determiner. Now, then the end of the paper, I'm just going to say one or two things here, remind you what my reconstructions are and what the variation is, and remind you of what the methodology is. Whatever we reconstruct, the reconstruction, of course, has to have evidence in the contemporary languages, and I've shown you evidence for these determiners and for the topic marker K, and maybe for the, for the, and for the prepositions E and possibly also for S and how to derive the contemporary variation in our, um, in our cognate set here uh, is through processes of natural syntactic change. And what I have proposed is essentially one process that gets repeated several times. So some head of a superstructure selecting an argument in topic position is reanalyzed as a case marking determiner. Um, so that is all I have to say. Thank you very much. And sorry for going over. No problem. Thank you. Uh, now I think the chat is open and we can have the questions come in. They hurt me. <laughs> nope. Victoria. Uh, 
you can unmute yourself. Hi, thanks, Edith. Um, I just have several kind of interrelated questions. Um, so my first, my first question was, um, what exactly was the evidence for K being reconstructable to proto-Austronesian as the topic marker? Um, is that mainly based on evidence from Rukai? And if it was, it seems that we only get one primary branch bearing that evidence, and I'm not sure do, if you have any other thing to say about about that evidence or about you know why it's reconstructable. Oh, so you want me to answer that one first? Sure. Um, this will, so first of all, it's, uh, yes, it's one primary branch, but of course there are only two primary branches, remember? Um, and even if you assume this subgrouping hypothesis, no, if you assume Malcolm Ross's approach, which then flattens Rukite, so Puyuma and nuclear Austronesian, then it's one of four, it's actually two of four, because, and this, this, is, this is correct. Uh, there is, I mean, we have these two innovations. So I don't think that you're in a position to argue against that currently. Um, so we at minimally have these four, and it is, re it is reflected in both Rukai and also in nuclear Austronesian. And this gives me an opportunity to go back to my pronouns from Amis. I love these pronouns. So these guys. Uh, so we have, how many languages did I say here? Several uh, languages reflect K marking on pronouns as nominative. And note that we have the, the forms here. There are two things to note about this. It's not key attaching to these pronouns. It is just the bare K. And then there is a stem vowel in these pronominal forms. This stem vowel was uh, present in Proto-Austronesian. I agree basically with Malcolm Ross's reconstructions of the personal pronouns in Pan. I have minor quibbles, but for the most part, I agree with him. So the reconstructions of those pronouns are basically um, everything except the K in the nominative paradigm. But these were not the clitics. The clitics were only monosyllabic. The bisyllabic ones were independent forms. So these are the ones that could be topicalized, and they show the K. You see that? So this is evidence that these were topicalized forms. Crucially also, and this is really important for my argument, we have K marking on nominative pronouns that are reconstructable as topic forms, not as clitic forms, and it's only for first and second person. Now, why is this crucial? This has to do with licensing. So I said that licensing must be flagged either if the argument is in its structural case position, if it gets a morphological case marker, or if it's flagged by agreement. First and second person uh, is it shows up as agreement on the verb, clitic pronouns on the verb. I showed an example of that for Rukai a little while ago, and it it's fully reconstructable to Proto-Austronesian. I don't think that Ross would disagree with me on this point, but only, crucially, first and second person. And it, if you look at the Amis, for instance, the Amis uh, pronominal paradigm, the another thing that's happened, there are actually lots of innovations that plausibly can be said to have taken place in proto-nuclear Austronesian. I'm only beginning to explore them. But another one is the innovation of third person personal pronouns. But these are never marked with K. So K was not nominative because um, K cannot go with the third person. The third person is never flagged by agreement on the verb. So uh, that, that's additional evidence. So we see it in two of four the K marking two of four of four primary subgroups. Yeah, okay. so this kind of links nicely to my second question, which is about the internal stack grouping of nuclear astronomy you assumed. Um, so if we go with Ross stack grouping, which has four primary branches, then I really want to see more about how exactly this K topicalization stuff can be reconstructable to proto-nuclear astronomy. So I think for Amaze, this works pretty well, but Amaze is just one of the very many languages under this putative, you know, nuclear Austronesian branch. So yeah, so that was my question. Do you have 
So what's the internal sex routine to assume? And is there any other language that looks very much like Amis? Oh, there are some others. I think I listed them a moment ago. Um, and they, they behave pretty much the same. Oh, it's a Kanakanavu is another one. Um, that's pretty high. Yeah. Um, there's, there's several of them. I don't remember them off the top of my head. Uh, but you can look at the handout and see. I think I listed them. I don't remember off the top of my head. There's like four or five. Okay. Well, and we see them, um, we see them all floating around in Malayo Polynesian languages too. They, um, the, the, the function isn't quite as easy to discern anymore. Um, because, I mean, these languages have undergone their own innovations, right? But we see it in things like kita, kami, kamu, these things. And they, these are still reflected in Malayo Polynesian, right? So they, they're floating around all over the place. So they exist. Um, I saw Dan has a question, but I'll just quickly finish this very quick question. So um, it looks like in many of these languages, topic and the so called normative or pivot are many of them just homophonous. And I think that's also the case for Rukai. And so I wonder whether, so some people would argue that this top by marker is homophonous with either or normative just because it's the default marking. So if that's the case, do we really need to assume a reanalysis or that it's just a general pattern? Because you do see that homophony regardless of whether this topic slash normative is in the K form or not. So that was my yeah, quick question. I, I don't actually think that's true anymore. So although, well, well that, no, 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 I, that's something we can think about. That's something we can think about and just say there is no nominative marking. Yeah, so I think that view, so your view, right? That this is just topic marking, right? Um, that might be possible. I, yeah, my, proposal is probably not incompatible with the view like that. I already said that this talk today doesn't really address the question of alignment. I don't think it's, it's evidence for or for either or any uh, particular approach. So um, I'll think about that. Um, but oh, no, no, well, that's not true, though, in the pronouns, right? Uh, so synchronically in the pronouns, they really are um, so like the Amis one, these have been reanalyzed as bound forms, right? So that those are not topics anymore, right? So, no. Okay. 